afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Amy Hewitt. I'm the Executive Director for the Scleroderma Research Foundation, and we are pleased to have you with us for today's session, Understanding the GI Microbiome and Scleroderma. As research and new treatment options continue to evolve, and our, it's our commitment to bring the latest developments to you. And for all of us at the SRF, it's an honor to be able to provide this forum to the scleroderma community. It's now my pleasure to introduce our special guest for today. Dr. Elizabeth Volkman is a rheumatologist and founder and co-director of the UCLA Connective Tissue Research Program in Interstitial Lung Disease and contributes to the Connective Tissue Disease Research Area at the UCLA Microbiome Center. She is an active clinical and translational researcher with special focus on scleroderma with emphasis investigating the pulmonary, GI, and vascular dimensions of the disease. Today's session will feature 40 minutes on Dr. Volkman's recent research on the gut microbiome and its link to scleroderma, and then we'll wrap up with about 15 minutes of Q&A time. The phone lines have all been muted, so if you have a question, please use the chat box in the conference window just to the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and remember that all of our webinars are for educational purposes only, and no information provided is to be considered personal medical advice. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Elizabeth and understanding the GI microbiome and scleroderma. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being with us today. Hi, thank you, Amy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just great. Great, okay. Well, I wanna thank the Scleroderma Research Foundation for inviting me to do this webinar today. I'm very grateful to all of you for calling in too and taking the time. Um, I'm excited to speak with you today about some of the research I've done and others have done on the GI microbiome in scleroderma. I'm just advancing. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, and I have no disclosures for this research that I do, so no conflicts of interest. So the objectives of the talk today are really to review these five key areas. And I wanna encourage you throughout the talk to think about questions you may wanna ask when the talk concludes. But I'm gonna begin the discussion by reviewing the features or symptoms of gastrointestinal tract or GIT problems and systemic sclerosis. I'm gonna focus specifically on the lower GI tract as this is an area that doesn't often get a lot of attention in research and I'll go through what we know at this point about the pathobiology or the causes of lower GIT problems in scleroderma. I'll then transition into the research that we've done here at UCLA comparing patients' microbiome from their GI tract of scleroderma patients with healthy controls and trying to identify which bacteria or microbes are associated with symptoms. And then finally, I'll conclude with some of our latest research where we've looked not only at scleroderma patients who come to our center at UCLA, but also a very geographically distinct group of scleroderma patients from Norway. Now, I've tried to make this talk very non-technical because I realize everyone's coming to this discussion with a different level of experience. So some of this may be very basic for you. Um, but there are some terms that are just unavoidable to use when I do this discussion, and I just want to make sure the definitions for these terms are clear. So when we talk about microbiome, what we're really talking about is an ecosystem. So a group or a collection of microorganisms in a particular part of the body. So the gut has a microbiome, your skin has a microbiome. It's really like these small ecosystems. And the microorganisms in these environments include bacteria, they include viruses and fungi. For this talk, we focus mainly on bacteria. And we're gonna focus specifically on colonic bacteria, so the colonic microbiome. And then there's two other terms that will come up when I discuss the research, and I think these are important to note. So there's a term called beta diversity. And what this means is basically differences in the microorganism or microbiome composition between two different groups or between two different parts of the body. It's really overall compositional differences in the bacteria in a particular area. And then finally, we talk about microbial abundance. This is the, actually the amount of a specific bacteria. 
So sometimes a bacteria can be present or absent. When it's present, we care about how high the level is or the concentration of this bacteria is. So these are the terms that I think are important to understand and just moving forward. And again, if you have any questions, please make note of them for us. And then the last bit of just background education is understanding sort of the hierarchy. So some of you may have taken biology and learned that there's a classification system of different microbes. And I've given one example here of the species E. coli, which many of you have probably heard of. This is a common cause of um, gastroenteritis or urinary tract infections. But this basically shows you all the different levels, starting at the highest level, the domain, going all the way down to the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So when you get down to the species level, that's the most specific you can get about a particular bacteria. And the reason I bring this up is when we do microbiome research, we're mainly interested in genus and species level differences between patients or between parts of the body. Um, we think that these lower level changes are what are more likely to contribute to disease states than looking at just phylum differences or class differences. And I think this will become more clear as we move forward. All right, so let's begin by talking about some of the symptoms of GIT dysfunction in scleroderma. And most of you may be familiar with these. So this is actually a leading cause of morbidity in patients with scleroderma. About 90% of patients who have scleroderma have some involvement of their GI tract. So after the skin, the GI tract is the second most common organ system involved in scleroderma. And both the upper and lower GI tract can be involved. And many patients, even when they have involvement of their GI tract, can be entirely asymptomatic in the beginning. These are the areas of the gut that are involved, so you can see that it can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract. And these are the percentages of patients that are typically afflicted with problems in these areas. So the majority of patients have problems with their esophagus, 70 to 90 percent. About 10 to 30 percent have problems with their stomach. 10 to 50 percent have problems with their small or large intestine or both and 50 to 70% have problems with their rectum. What are the symptoms that correspond to these areas of the GI tract? Well, most of you probably understand these symptoms better than anyone. So when the esophagus is involved, patients can have what's called dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. They can have reflux or heartburn. When the stomach is involved, Patients can report early satiety, so just eating small amounts of food can cause one to feel um, distended or bloated. When the colon is involved, you can have diarrhea, constipation, as well as bowel pseudoobstruction. And when the small intestine is involved, remember the small intestine is what's responsible for absorbing the nutrients from our foods, there can be malabsorption, which can lead to weight loss. And then finally, when the lower part of the colon, the rectum and the anus are involved, patients can have fecal incontinence, loss of control of their bowels, and rectal prolapse. These are the frequency of, of these various symptoms in one group of patients that was studied. And they broke it down based on whether a patient had limited or diffuse cutaneous disease. And remember, we make the distinction between limited and diffuse cutaneous disease purely based on the extent of sclerosis of the skin. So if you have involvement from your elbows down, your knees down, and your neck up, you have limited scleroderma. If you have any involvement of your upper arms, your thighs, your chest, your abdomen, you have diffuse scleroderma. And what this bar chart shows is that the frequency of these symptoms in limited, which is in the blue, and diffuse, which is in the orange, the frequencies are very similar. The only distinction is heartburn, which tends to occur more commonly in patients with limited disease. But you can see that both groups of patients are troubled by many of these symptoms. 
And again, we're focusing on lower GI tract symptoms because this is an area that is very problematic for patients and there hasn't traditionally been a lot of research done on these symptoms in the past. But these symptoms are very disruptive as many of you know. They can compromise lifestyle, emotional well-being, and quality of life. Many of my patients are unable to go out to dinner because of these symptoms or sit through a movie or have to do a lot of preparing even just to take long car trips. And we don't have a lot of treatment options at the current time. We often prescribe medications to promote motility in, in patients who have dysmotility, but many of these medications aren't even available in certain countries, including the United States. Oftentimes, patients are given rotating cycles of antibiotics, which seem to provide temporary relief, but certainly don't resolve the problem long term. Laxatives are often given as a supportive measure to help with constipation, and many patients are using probiotics, but these are often very rarely regulated, um, so you don't know exactly what you're getting, and there's not been very many good studies on probiotics in scleroderma. So part of our problem with treating this dimension of scleroderma is that we don't have the best understanding of the cause. So I'll go through what, what we know and what we historically have thought the pathobiology of the cause of these symptoms are. So I think of them really in three different ways. There's changes in the blood vessels of the gut. And many of you have experienced problems with changes in your blood vessels and other parts of your body, like Raynaud's phenomenon. There can be changes in the blood vessels within the gut, and this is an example of the inside of someone's stomach who has some, something called watermelon stomach, where the blood vessels get large and they're likely to, to bleed, um, and this can cause tissue death and, again, anemia and fatigue. So there's probably problems with the blood vessels. There's also problems with the nervous system. So when there's this overabundance of collagen, this can actually compress the nerves. So in the skin, you know how the collagen becomes um, overexpressed and this can lead to the hardening. The same process can happen within the muscles of the gut, which is what is represented here on the slide. You can see the slide on the left is a GI tract of a patient with scleroderma and that blue matter <clears throat> represents the collagen. When these nerve fibers are compressed, it can cause autonomic dysfunction. And your autonomic nervous system is responsible for regulating how you digest food and how your gut moves. And so when this system is disrupted, it can cause dysmotility. There's probably also an inflammation part to this as well. And when the nerves are affected by inflammation, this can affect their function too. So there's probably blood vessel changes, nervous system changes, and then changes in the muscles itself. So you have muscles all along your GI tract to move things along. And these muscles can atrophy, meaning loss of muscle, and they become weaker. And the muscles can get fibrosis too, so that collagen deposition. This is an example here, a very extreme example of someone who has obstruction. And you can see from this radiograph that the colon is very dilated and it's very stretched because there's an obstruction, we call this pseudo-obstruction, and things aren't moving well, probably from the atrophy of the muscles. So when we think about the cause or the pathobiology, we think there are some primary problems. So the muscle atrophy or weakness, the collagen deposition, and then the dysmotility. And then we think these primary problems probably lead to secondary problems or consequences. So there can be anatomical changes, right? When you get obstruction, um, you can get volvulus or interception, and this is basically twisting of the colon, which can also cause obstruction. And then lastly, this issue of bacterial overgrowth. Many of you may have been tested for this condition with a breath test, but this is looking for the overabundance of certain bacteria in the small intestine. And traditionally, we thought that these bacteria become overabundant when the colon or the intestines move more slowly. 
And we know this because antibiotics seem to help a lot of lower GI tract symptoms, at least temporarily. But there's now more evidence that changes in the bacteria of the gut may be present early, so even prior to the presence of dysmotility. And there was one study that I cite here that was done in France where they looked at consecutive patients with scleroderma and they performed a hydrogen breath test. And almost half of them had a positive breath test. And these were patients who did not complain of any GI symptoms. So there was evidence in this group of patients with scleroderma that their GI tract microbiome was altered even before they had dysmotility. So we have to ask ourselves, is you know, a chicken and egg kind of question, is it the dysmotility causing the changes in the bacteria, or perhaps it's the changes in the bacteria that are causing the dysmotility and other problems. And so when I was doing my training in rheumatology at UCLA, I saw a number of patients with scleroderma with my mentors, Dr. Clemens and Dr. First, and this problem really troubled me. And so I decided to do a research project to explore the microbiome in scleroderma. And I was very fortunate to link up with another mentor, Dr. Jonathan Braun, who was an expert in the microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And he was generous to support the research that I did early on to see whether there were changes in the gut microbiome of patients with scleroderma. So we designed a study, and the objectives of this study were to compare the colonic microbial composition of scleroderma patients versus healthy patients and to determine whether any of the bacteria, and again, we're looking at genus-level bacteria or genera, if any of them were specifically associated with symptoms, because these may be potential therapeutic targets. So to do this, we recruited adult patients with scleroderma who were coming to our clinics at UCLA. All of them had to be able to undergo a colonoscopy, and they had to be able to be off antibiotics and probiotics for at least three weeks before this colonoscopy. They could not have any other GI conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or malignancy or cancer that could affect their results. And then we recruited healthy patients, and we matched them to the scleroderma patients by age and gender. Everyone underwent the same bowel prep before their colonoscopy. They could not be on any other laxatives one week prior. And then during the colonoscopy, we sampled fluid from the cecum and sigmoid areas of the colon. These are two distinct regions of the colon. And when we sampled fluid through lavage, we collected the bacteria that were basically adherent to the mucosa or stuck to the inner lining of the colon in these two areas. We also wanted to look at GI symptoms. And Dinesh Khanna, who used to work at UCLA, developed a very nice questionnaire to assess GI symptoms. And, and probably a lot of you have taken this questionnaire. It's a valid questionnaire, meaning it's been tested in a number of different scleroderma cohorts throughout the world. It's been translated in different languages, and it has seven domains. Um, this box is blocking a couple of them, but it's basically reflux, distension and bloating, diarrhea, fecal soilage, constipation, emotional well-being, and social functioning. And I have this box here to highlight the domains that we're interested in looking in, so the symptoms that relate to lower GIT dysfunction. And to do microbiome analysis, it's basically like gene analysis or gene sequencing, where we basically um, use a special machine to sequence specific bacteria genes. And then once we have those sequences, we look through a database, and the database tells us, okay, this is the, the sequence for E. coli, this is the sequence for Fusobacterium. So it's a sequencing analysis. So here were our results from this initial study. So we recruited 17 patients with scleroderma and 17 healthy controls. They had a similar age, and this is represented of the average age for scleroderma, around 50 years. 
The majority of patients were women, which again is characteristic of a lot of scleroderma research studies. Um, we had about 53% Caucasians and 35% Hispanics in this cohort. 35% had diffuse cutaneous disease, and the median disease duration was about 6.6 .6 years. And you can see, though, this is the interquartile range. So we had some patients with very early disease, 2.5 years, and we had some patients who had very established disease. And for this initial study, we kind of wanted to include everyone just to see if we could find any signals. Very few patients in the study were using immunosuppression, so only three patients were using prednisone, and three were using another immunosuppressant. Um, two were on mycophenolate or Celsep, and one was on azathioprine or Imuran. And I mention this because immunosuppressant use probably affects the microbiome because it affects the immune system, which interacts that's all right. So again, I think immunosuppressant use does affect the microbiome, but very few patients in this cohort were using any immunosuppression. And then when we looked at their self-reported questionnaire about their GIT symptoms, I report the scores here. And the scores for the domains that have the star indicate it was an average moderate severity. So for this particular group, most of them reported moderate severity of distension, bloating, constipation, emotional well-being, and social functioning. There was mild severity in terms of diarrhea and fecal soilage. And now getting into the main results of the study. So if you remember from that first slide about definitions, the beta diversity. So again, this is the compositional differences in the microbiome of different groups. So each one of these circles represents a sample. And the ones that are open circles are the healthy controls, and the ones that are the closed black circles represent the scleroderma patients. And this is a, what we call a principal coordinate analysis. And what I wanted to show you here was that these samples separate out in space. So you can see that the open circles cluster together and the black circles cluster together. And I put a p-value there because that's our way as scientists of knowing whether these differences are significant. So this was highly significantly different. So these samples separated out mostly based on whether or not a patient had scleroderma. And this was for the cecum part of the colon. We found very similar findings when we looked at the colon. Again, the open circles are the healthy controls, and the closed circles are the scleroderma patients. So this told us, yes, there are some differences in the composition of the GI microbiome in the colon of patients with scleroderma versus healthy controls. But again, we're interested in lower level changes. So the next step was to look at differences in specific genera, so genus level changes. And in this slide, I show you here the green bars correspond to the bacteria that were increased in scleroderma compared to the controls. The red represents those bacteria that were decreased in scleroderma compared with the controls. And I've highlighted a few here. So if you look at the ones that are circled in that violet color, the Reichenella, Clostridium, and Fisola bacterium, these are what we consider commensal organisms, so organisms that we think are healthy for the gut and they protect against inflammation and disease. And these were lower in scleroderma compared with the healthy patients. Conversely, the ones that I've highlighted in yellow, Fusobacterium, Erwinia, and Trabzusiella, these are ones that are considered pathobionts, so we think they're more invasive and they've been more associated with disease state in scleroderma. I've also put some yellow areas just to highlight that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium were actually higher in the scleroderma patients compared with the controls. And this was a surprising finding to us. Many of you who may take probiotics know most probiotics are comprised of either lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. These were actually higher in the scleroderma patients. And again, very few of these patients had been taking probiotics, and none of them were taking them before we collected this sample. So this was surprising to us. So this was for the cecum, but we found very similar findings in the sigmoid. 
the lower levels of the commensal organisms like Rhychonella fusilobacterium, higher levels of pathobiont organisms such as fusobacterium or winium, and again, we saw those higher levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And since we did this study, we've now found in three other cohorts that the lactobacillus is higher in scleroderma. So we found it in another UCLA study, um, in a Norwegian cohort, as well as in a Swedish cohort. In addition, we wanted to know which bacteria were higher in patients who had more symptoms. So the fusobacterium and actinobacillus were actually higher in patients with increased GI symptoms. And the bacteroides, candidatus, and clostridium were actually um, higher in patients who had decreased symptoms. So taken together, we found that the scleroderma disease state was associated with compositional differences. And these were characterized by increase in gamma proteobacteria, increased fusobacterium, increased prevotella, as well as decreased bacteroides, decreased clostridium, and decreased fusobacterium. And I put a star by the ones that were also associated with symptoms. So patients with more symptoms had higher levels of fusobacterium. Patients with lower symptoms had higher levels of bacteroides and clostridium. So to conclude, we discovered that the scleroderma disease state was associated with a distinct colonic microbial consortium. And this was characterized by increased pathobiont genera and decreased healthy beneficial commensal genera. And one interesting thing was that we found these differences sort of overlapped with what we see in Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is another autoimmune disease. And what's interesting is that like scleroderma, it not only has an inflammation part to it, but it also has fibrosis. So a lot of other autoimmune diseases, and some of you may have other autoimmune diseases or overlap syndromes with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. These are autoimmune diseases that are mostly characterized by inflammation. They don't have fibrosis. But Crohn's disease is unique, and it's unique like scleroderma is in that it not only has the inflammation, but it also has fibrosis. So then I want to get into some of the more recent research we've done. And this is looking at scleroderma patients from two different geographic cohorts. And it's important to do this because we want to make sure that we're not just looking at one population of scleroderma patients, but we explore all different populations. And so I formed a collaboration with Dr. Anna Maria Hoffman Vold, who's a scleroderma expert at Oslo University Hospital in Norway. And she came to UCLA to work with me during 2015 and 2016 to do more research on the microbiome. And she actually collected a lot of samples in Norway and then had them shipped to UCLA where we did all of the analysis. So our objective for this study was to, again, compare GI microbial composition of scleroderma patients to controls but using two different cohorts. And we also wanted to look at stool samples. So if you remember for that first study, we looked at the colonoscopy samples from the lavage. And I have to tell you, most of my patients were not very excited about doing elective colonoscopies <laughs> for obvious reasons. So the stool sampling is just a much more feasible approach. We also, again, wanted to determine whether certain bacteria were associated with symptoms. We again recruited patients from the clinics at UCLA and Oslo University Hospital. These were all adults. Again, even before they did their stool collection, they had to be off antibiotics and probiotics, and they couldn't have any other GI conditions. And then we matched these to healthy controls in a one-to-one -one ratio. The patient collected the stool specimen at home and then froze it immediately and then when they were ready to come to their clinic appointment, they transferred it on ice. So here were the characteristics. So we actually sampled from the same 17 UCLA patients, and we also had 17 Norwegian patients. 
the Norwegian patients were slightly older, um, had slightly less women, and there were some racial differences. Um, obviously, in Norway, the population is more homogeneous. They're almost all Viking genetically, um, so there was that difference. But in both cohorts, very few, again, were taking any immunosuppression. Um, very few were using probiotics. Um, and a large majority of the UCLA cohorts were using proton pump inhibitors, things like omeprazole, to help with reflux, 29% uh, in the Oslo cohort. When we looked at GI symptoms, these two different groups of scleroderma patients were also well-matched in terms of their severity of GI symptoms. So again, those scores that have the star, these indicate moderate severity and the ones with the cross were none to mild. So for distension and bloating, constipation, emotional well-being, these were moderate severity for both groups, whereas diarrhea, fecal soilage were none to mild severity for both groups. And then other characteristics of these patients that I think is notable to point out, a lot of you have heard of the ANA test, the anti-nuclear antibody test. This was positive in the majority of patients, and this is characteristic of scleroderma, where most patients who have scleroderma will have a positive ANA. It's extremely rare not to have a positive ANA. In this group, about a quarter of patients had an antibody called SCL70, or anti-topoisomerase antibody. This antibody is associated with having, um, in many cases, more severe or diffuse skin disease and interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. About a half in each group had the anti-centromere antibody. This is an antibody that's often associated with the future development of pulmonary hypertension. And then a similar percentage had diffuse cutaneous disease. And the median disease duration was similar in both groups, with, again, a range, because we were trying to look at all comers for this initial study. The one large distinction, though, between these two groups that I want to point out is that more patients in the UCLA cohort had pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease on their CT scan. And this may be related to the fact that a lot of these were my patients, and I see a lot of patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Now, going back to the beta diversity, again, this is looking at compositional differences. And you can see the open circles on the left, these are the UCLA samples. The stars are the Oslo samples. And then the closed circles are the controls. So on this principal coordinate analysis, these three groups are separating out. And when we looked at, okay, what is the difference? Is there a significant difference between the scleroderma patients from Oslo and the healthy controls? Yes, the p-value was very low. And then when we looked, is there a difference between the control patients and the UCLA patients? Yes, it was actually even a bigger difference. The p-value was even lower and the R-squared was higher. So this suggested, again, to us there were compositional differences and the GI microbiome of patients with scleroderma compared with controls, not just in the UCLA group, but also in the Norwegian group. And then again, we wanted to look at lower level differences, so genus level differences. So the red bars here, that sort of flipped compared with the last few slides, but the red represents those that were increased in scleroderma. The blue represents those that were decreased. And I've underlined the ones that we saw in the other study that I want to call your attention to. So once again, bacteroides and fusilobacterium were lower in the scleroderma patients compared with the controls, whereas fusobacterium or winium and then lactobacillus again were higher in the scleroderma patients compared with the controls. When we looked at the Norwegian group, we found some similar findings. So like our other study, Bacteroides clostridium were actually lower in the scleroderma patients compared with the controls, whereas Lactobacillus was again higher in scleroderma. And then we wanted to relate the GI symptoms to specific bacteria. And we found that patients who had higher levels of clostridium 
had decreased distension and bloating symptoms, as well as decreased overall GI symptoms. Um, Blaudia abundance was also associated with decreased symptom score. And then Prevotella actually was associated with increased distension and bloating and increased diarrhea. So how do we interpret these findings? Well, we again demonstrated distinct microbial compositional differences between the scleroderma patients and the healthy controls, so that beta diversity. But we appreciated the most extreme differences between the scleroderma patients in UCLA to the healthy controls and less extreme differences between the scleroderma patients from Norway and the healthy controls. And there may be several explanations for this difference. One possibility, as I pointed out, more patients in the UCLA cohort had pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, so they may have been more ill. Um, there could be genetic differences. Again, the majority of the patients that were examined in Norway were Caucasian. Also, their diet probably plays a role, too, in terms of differences in dietary intake in the Norwegian cohort versus the UCLA cohort. But to summarize, we found specific genus level differences. So increased fusobacterium, increased acromancia, increased ruminococcus, increased lactobacillus. And I've starred here the ones that were also observed in our prior study. Then decreased bacteroides and decreased fusobacterium. So to conclude, this study demonstrated now in two different scleroderma populations that there are increased pathobiont genera, so bacteria that we think are invasive and may cause inflammation, decreased beneficial commensal genera that may actually help the immune system and protect against inflammation, and that many of the findings were consistent with our prior study where we looked at the, the colonoscopy lavage samples. And these disease-associated organisms and potentially the, the products of these bacteria, so their metabolic products, offer potential targets for intervention for either, you know, increasing the levels of the organisms that were depleted that may be related to symptoms or somehow selectively decreasing the levels of the ones that were high and were associated with increased symptoms. So I just want to again review the objectives, and again, I hope you have a lot of good questions at the end of this talk, but we began by reviewing the features of gastrointestinal problems in scleroderma, and what I want to emphasize from that learning point is that any part of the GI tract can be involved, and the majority of patients have GI tract symptoms at some point during the course of their scleroderma. We then talked about the causes of what's known historically of these lower problems. And I presented three different main areas, so problems with the blood vessels, problems with the nerves, and then problems with muscle weakness. But then we got into the research into the microbiome, and maybe some of these changes in the bacterial composition are what's driving some of the downstream effects in terms of changes in the blood vessels, the muscles, and the nerves. And we compared patients with scleroderma and healthy controls, and we found there were distinct differences between these two groups. We also found that certain bacteria were associated with symptoms. So patients with higher levels of fusobacterium had more symptoms. Patients with higher levels of clostridium and bacteroides had lower symptoms. And then we can looked at another scleroderma population from Norway, and we found very similar findings. I would like to acknowledge many of the people that have helped me with this research, including Dr. Jonathan Braun, who I mentioned earlier, who is the expert in inflammatory bowel disease, who really helped me get this research started, and then my colleague and friend, Dr. Anna Maria Hoffman Bold, who's in Norway, who we still uh, work together on this research. And oh, this is my Instagram. I'm just starting to learn about Instagram. So if you're interested, I try to post things related to scleroderma, but I'm just getting started with it. 
And then um, this is a picture of our UCLA CTD ILD program group. And I just wanted to point out Dr. Hoffman Vold, who is sitting um, to the right of me. And then behind her is Dr. Donald Tashkid, who actually um, is a mentor of mine as well. And he was the principal investigator for both of the scleroderma lung studies, so the two largest clinical trials that have been done to date looking at treatments for scleroderma lung disease. And I would just, again, like to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about an area that I'm very passionate about. And um, I thank you for your time. And I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We have um, just about 15 minutes left. And there's lots of great questions coming in. So I'm happy to field great. them to you. Um, OK. We're getting lots of questions, and you can also look at them in the question window as well, but um, we're getting lots of questions about um, the use of probiotics or digestive en enzymes. Are they helpful um, or not? Or Yeah, so in terms of probiotics, there's been one study that was um, published in a peer-reviewed journal, and it looked at a small group of patients with scleroderma where they were given, most of them were given a probiotic called Align, um, and they were followed over a period of time, and their symptoms seemed to improve. But the problem with this study was there was no control group. So as you, many of you know, the symptoms of GI problems kind of wax and wane with time. So this study really didn't address the question, do probiotics work in scleroderma? Um, I think, you know, we're starting to do a study in that now at UCLA, and others will probably do the same. And the only way to answer that question is to really do the research. Many of these probiotics are not regulated, so you don't know exactly what you're getting. And a lot of studies suggest that they don't even colonize the colon, so they may just go right through you. So a lot of research is being done in, in the biotech world to develop better probiotics that get to the area you want them to get to. You know, they don't get broken down in the stomach. And not only do they get to those areas, but they stay there and they become resident bacteria. So this is a big, exciting area of research. But until these studies are done, um, I don't think it's fair to say that the ones that are available now help to a large degree. Uh, great. Um, thank you. Um, we're also getting lots of questions about diet, um, such as, you know, is a vegan diet or gluten-free helpful for GI symptoms? And also on the same, um, in the same vein, is sugar um, harmful? Um, are there other things that kind of create an imbalance in the, in the gut bacteria that people should be aware of? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And nutrition has been a long um, area of interest of mine even before I got into microbiome work because I really think of food as, as medicine. And I think one of the problems is that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of books out there about this is the autoimmune diet or this is the scleroderma diet or do the FODMAP diet. And what I try to tell my patients is there's no one size fits all when it comes to your diet and how it affects your health. Really, it has to be very individualized. So not everyone will do well on a vegan diet or not everyone benefits from a gluten-free diet. Those things are very specific. But what I will say is that there's probably some general things that could be good for microbiome health that could apply to everyone. I think one of the things is avoiding processed foods. So processed foods are things that come in packages, like in boxes or plastic bags, and they're often things that have a lot of ingredients. And many of these ingredients, I would have to go back to organic chemistry to even remember what they are because they're chemical preservatives. These are things that I don't think are helpful to someone who has an immune system that's not functioning well, as they could maybe potentially promote inflammation. So I would recommend that if you're going to have some type of food that comes in a package or a bag that you look for things that have as few ingredients as possible. So obviously it's better to have an apple than apple juice, right? But even if you're going to have like a bag of chips, like try to get something that has very few ingredients um, because this is probably more closer to the source food and, and easier for your body to digest and handle. That I think is something everyone can benefit from. I also think that trying to eat organic food may be helpful. Again, there aren't 
studies on this in scleroderma. This is a personal opinion. And obviously, eating organic food is not always feasible to everyone. But again, this limits your exposure to chemicals and pesticides, which could really um, weaken an immune system that's already not functioning properly. And then I think the sugar question is a really good one. Um, a number of studies have found that you know, the sugars that you have in soft drinks like Coca-Cola, these do um, cause an overabundance of certain bacterial species. So I would avoid eating things that have allotted added sugars. You know, natural sugars that come in certain fruits are fine, but things that have a lot of added sugar probably do cause certain bacteria that love those sugars to overproliferate. So those would be like the three things if you could remember would be the try not to eat something that has too many ingredients in it. Um, if you can, try to eat organic where possible and then limit things that have added sugar. And then beyond that, I would really recommend that you work with your doctor or work with a nutritionist to fine tune, okay, is a, you know, avoiding gluten right for me? Is cutting out dairy right for me? Because it's going to be different for everyone. There's no one single autoimmune diet. Yeah, makes sense. Good advice. Um, we're getting a lot of questions on um, what the consensus is on fecal transplants and are they um, effective and safe and, um, and uh, will they help restore a bacterial imbalance? Excellent. So this is another fantastic question and very timely. So fecal transplant has not been studied yet in scleroderma, but we are applying for funding, and Dr. hoffman Bold is also applying for funding to do a study on this in scleroderma. Now, it has been studied in other diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, and the results have been uh, kind of controversial. It has helped some patients, but it doesn't always lead to a sustained improvement. Where it's been really effective is helping with um, certain infections, such as C. difficile, which is a very terrible GI infection. Some patients get this and antibiotics just don't work, but fecal transplant helps them. So I think it's really um, promising and it's certainly evolved. You know, previously fecal transplant was done by giving a patient a nasal gastric tube, which they still do sometimes, but now they've gotten to the point where they can culture the, the perfect bacteria for your for your gut and then you take it in pill form. So I think this is really the future um, and, and it's an exciting area of research that we're starting to pursue. Great. Um, I do have um, a couple more questions that maybe we can try and get to you and then I think we'll, we will try and wrap it up for the day. Um, okay. I have a couple of people asking, um, immunosuppressive therapy effect on the gut microbiome, is there a, thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think I alluded to this just briefly earlier, but I'm glad someone brought it up again, that I do think that immunosuppression does affect the gut microbiome because it's affecting the immune system. And the immune system and the gut microbiome really have this interplay where they work together, where specific bacteria are found to actually increase certain inflammatory markers or cytokines. So suppressing the immune system likely does have an effect. Now, what that effect is in terms of specific bacteria, we don't know. And we are doing a larger study now at UCLA to collect more samples. We had so few patients in our initial studies on immunosuppression, we couldn't really adequately answer that question. But with a larger group of patients, we'll be able to see, do these patients who are taking Celsept or taking Imuran, do these patients have differences in their microbiome that may be explained by their medications more than even their disease. Okay, great. Um, let's see, one more question. Um, somebody's asking if you have looked further into a condition called leaky gut or intestinal, intestinal permeability um, as a co-condition to poor microbiome diversity. Is there a correlation there or? Yeah, so leaky gut syndrome is what's thought when bacteria are thought to translocate or kind of go across the bowel wall and then get into your systemic, your circulation and cause inflammation. And no one has studied that in scleroderma per se, but I think that the, the effects of this, you know, in terms of inflammation seen in other parts of the body that may 
derive from a gut origin, I think this absolutely happens in scleroderma. And for a lot of autoimmune diseases, in fact, rheumatoid arthritis, there's more and more research that changes in the gut may be what's precipitating or triggering these, um, the inflammation that occurs elsewhere in your joints or in your lungs. Got it. Um, I, I know that we have so many questions, Elizabeth. I'm not sure if you're seeing any okay. of the other ones that I'm seeing too, but um, if, uh, if we um, may have one time for just one more if you want to try okay. and get to it. If not, we can wrap up for the day. Yeah, I'm happy to take one more question. Okay, let's see. Um, a question regarding uh, use of Relistor injections to promote bowel movements. Is that um, are you familiar with that's, that? Yeah, I think that's being done more experimentally. So um, it looks like I'm just reading the question, and mm -hmm. it looks like that has helped this particular participant. Um, so I thank you for that, and hopefully we can study that um, in a bigger fashion. Um, I see another question about prebiotic fibers in addition to probiotics, and I think that this is another important consideration. So prebiotics are substances that actually the healthy commensal bacteria, they feed off of these and can proliferate more. So it promotes the, your own growth of bacteria that are thought to help you. And um, there are supplements that are prebiotic, so inulin is one of them, and inulin is a supplement. Um, I like to get things more naturally, so I would try to eat foods that naturally have inulin in it, and these are things like artichoke and asparagus. Um, so prebiotics are also important. And then the, I guess maybe the last question someone asked was about the low FODMAP diet. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but this has become very popular. And this is a diet where you're basically eating foods that are low in roughage um, because it's thought that when you have a gut that moves more slowly, if you're eating a lot of these foods with roughage, so things like fruits that are pitted, that these actually can stick around in the gut too long and ferment. And I would be really cautious with following a FODMAP diet to the T, because if you look at the list of foods on the FODMAP diet restriction list, it's very long. And, and I think it's more important to um, not just eliminate that food, but think about how you combine foods. Um, so this may be on the scope of this talk, but if you're eating like a FODMAP food, like a certain fruit with something that's digested more slowly, like a fat, you may run into problems because your gut's going to slow down when it tries to digest that fat, and then the fruit sticks around longer. But if you're eating the fruit just alone, you may do okay. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, so I don't advise a strict FODMAP diet. I think looking at that list is important because patients can maybe try one of these things on its own and see, okay, did eating this peach bother me today? and for themselves. So I think it's good as like a guideline, but I don't think you should just automatically eliminate all these foods on the FODMAP diet because you could be missing out on a lot of good um, vitamins and minerals. Um, and just one, one last question on the same mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, idea. Is fiber yeah. um, beneficial for? So that's another area that's very um, dependent on on the patient and whether they have more constipation or more diarrhea um, and how the fiber is given. So that's, that's a definitely a question to like work with a doctor on because okay. it's so specific for a particular patient. Got but it, it's an excellent it. question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think we've um, gotten to as many questions as we could. Um, I see another one about fermented foods and I've seen a few questions along that front, but it sounds like it's, it's what you're suggesting is, um, that it's unique for each patient and um, they should consult their, their physician? Yeah, and I think just with the foods that can ferment, like eating them, trying to eat them alone if you're going to eat them versus combining them with something like a fat or a protein where the gut slows down naturally to try to break it down. If you combine those foods, you may run into trouble. But if you eat it just on its own or you eat it like if it's a vegetable, if you eat it cooked well, you may do okay. 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 
Well, I um, thank you so much again, Elizabeth, for your time. I know um, you know all the preparation time that you put into this, and and then the um, the hour that you spend with us is is really beneficial for the patient community. And um, I'm so grateful that we could provide this um, update for everybody. Um, just a couple of notes before we get going. Um, I want to remind everyone that we've got uh, two more sessions coming up. One in November. It's uh, an update on hand surgery for systemic sclerosis, led by Dr. James Chang at uh, Stanford. Um, that'll be on November 13th. And then December 15th, we'll have a session led by Julie Paik at Hopkins um, about skeletal myopathy and systemic sclerosis. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap it up for today. Um, thank you again so much, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, all of our webinars are available on demand at srfcure.org, or you can also find them on our YouTube channel. Um, and then as always, we welcome your feedback. So when you close the webinar window, um, if you could uh, just take a few minutes to complete the short survey, we always appreciate your input and want to make sure that we're giving, um, providing these sessions that are informative and important um, on topics that are important to you. Um, and then as always, please remember that we depend on your support for our continued investment in the most promising research. So for more information, you can visit us at srfcure.org or call our offices at 1-800-441-CURE. That's 1-800-441-CURE. 2873 to support our research program. Um, and thanks again for sharing time with us today. We look forward to our next sessions. And in the meantime, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, anything else you want to add, Elizabeth, before we wrap up for today? No, no, thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you. I am, as again, just really appreciate your time and, and your commitment to the community. It's uh, really, okay. really wonderful. All right. Thank you. Take and care. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye.